like there's no tomorrow. Hey! Welcome everyone to lecture number five of the financial engineering course uh, with a special focus on uh, interest rates and XVA. Today we will discuss a number of very important subjects regarding products, interest rate products traded in the market. We will start the lecture with an introduction of a simple, however very important products like interest rate swaps, forward trade agreements and all floating rate notes. And then we will move towards pricing of uh, uh, contracts, products that rely also on uh, volatilities, like for example, couplets, floorlets, etc. So let's take a look at the uh, content of today's lecture. We will start with a simple compounded forward rate, which will be uh, uh, giving us a flavor and also giving us the motivation uh, for the pricing of a forward rate agreement. In this part, we will discuss and define the LIBOR forward rate, which is going to be used in all the contracts in the interest rate world. And from now on, we will continue with those definitions throughout the course. Um, then the two important blocks of this uh, sections of this uh, uh, block today is the uh, floating rate note and interest rate swaps. Those are uh, functions, those are the payoffs that depend strongly on the definitions we will use in the first part. Uh, later on, we move to the uh, more, uh, let's say, financial engineering type of products where we have to deal with a modeling of, uh, uh, of um, underlying assumptions of the dynamics of the process. Here we will talk about the full white model under T forward measure. That's going to be very important once we talk about the pricing of uh, options on zero coupon bonds. And also when we discuss pricing of couplets, assuming a uh, uh, full white model, for example. Uh, in that context, we also discuss uh, pricing of uh, couplets, floorlets, and uh, either using a uh, black Scholes formula, also called Black's 76 formula, or using full white dynamics. We will finish this lecture uh, with a, a summary and also I have prepared two exercises that will give you more insight in the materials covered today. I would say the most important takeaway here, so this is nice division today we have. We have some linear products. When I talk about linear products, we always mean products that they are linear in terms of tradable assets. So for example, swaps because they're linearly depending on the LIBOR rate that we can see already directly from the market. And we also have some nonlinear relation when we talk about options. There we have to use uh, volatilities to price those derivatives. I hope you enjoy it. We have a one and a half hours ahead, and I hope that uh, it will be quite insightful lecture for you. Good luck. We will start with the idea of a so-called simple compounded forward rate. Imagine we have two counterparties, counterparty A and counterparty B. Those two counterparties will exchange cash flows, so they will transfer some money from one to, in, to another one. Um, counterparty A uh, will pay to counterparty B one euro at time T1. This is this scenario here. Uh, keep in mind that time T1 is not today, it is some date in the future. So we are here. We have a payment of one euro, so it's a minus one on the balance sheet of counterparty uh, A. And then at time T2, counterparty A will receive back one euro, so this is the, the covering the, uh, this cash flow, so we have one euro. And also additionally, we will receive some interest rate K over the actual time T2 and T1. So we have this period of time here, so this is, let me make a nicer bracket. We have this period of time over which the counterparty B will need to pay the interest over this period. Of course, counterparty B doesn't need to pay interest over this period because there were no cash flows before, but only the, over the period uh, over which this one euro was uh, lent to, uh, to part counterparty B. So we have uh, this cash flow here. So we have a uh, K, so it's one euro times K times time. So keep in mind that K is a, uh, so unknown number, so this is the percentage that you receive from this one euro, this is why this multiplication. We also have to adjust for time. So for example, if we receive 5% here, but we have two years, then we would expect we receive 10% overall because it's two times 5%. So this, this uh, uh, throwing period is very important. If, for example, you would borrow some, you would lend to somebody at rate 10%, but over a very short period of time, let's say a week, 
then obviously you don't want to give 10, 10% of this amount. You need to scale it down appropriately. Then it has to be a fraction, one week over a whole year. So this will be one over 52 or so. So the, the K, the percentage is always um, in terms of a rate per year. So it's a unit of interest rate. Okay, so we have this uh, cash flow. Of course, now we would like to see what is the current value of this uh, cash flow of this particular transaction. So if we look here, uh, standard, we always, what we start with, so this is uh, this illustration here represents a payoff. And now we have to discount all the cash flows. So this cash flow has to be discounted to today. And this cash flow has to be discounted also today. And then we can see the present value of this contract. So let's take a look. So what we do, we take an expectation under the risk neutral measure. We have a first cash flow is a payment of one euro. We discount money savings account from time t1 until time t0. So this is this first part of cash flow. And then we have a second where we have one plus, and then we have a, a, this additional interest rate we receive from this uh, uh, money that was lent to counterparty B. And that has to be discounted from time t2. And this we do with filtration T0. So this is today's date. Uh, first part, so this first expectation of this part is by definition zero coupon bond. As you remember, zero coupon bond, I think I repeated already many times, definition of it is expectation under risk neutral measure uh, E minus, then we have a T to T R S D S. This would be this. We have a filtration time T. And this is equivalent with expectation under Q of 1 over M T, actually M capital M T here, capital M T. Um, this is filtration G T. And normally you would also include here uh, zero uh, money savings account at time T in the, today's, but that by definition is equal to 1. So this is the relation between zero coupon bond and money savings account. <laughs> And this is why we get this uh, minus zero coupon bond at time t1. So this first expression. And for the other one, we have everything is, uh, uh, there is no stochasticity here. So it's almost the same as for this part. So we have one plus K times this accruing period times zero co coupon bond uh, PT zero T2. So you see, this is the PV. This is the current value of this uh, transaction. Um, what we do next is that we are, okay, so this is PV. Um, if you would like to enter um, this kind of um, contract where we exchange two cash flows, it's typically uh, we choose K, so we choose this interest rate, such that today, if you enter into this, let's say, swap, because you exchange two cash flows, uh, we would like to choose the strike, this uh, strike K, the percentage rate, such that the value of this contract is equal to zero. So this is basically... Uh, Nobody would like to pay right now for a contract which will start at time t1. Then we choose this percentage, k, such that the value today will be equal to zero. And if you do that, you can actually find out, so if you, of course, properly uh, put, uh, segregate all those terms, you end up with the following expression that k is equal to 1 over accruing period. And then we have a ratio of two zero coupon bonds, pt0 t1, pt0 t2, minus 1. So if you would substitute this k to this uh, PV, and you nicely, things will cancel out, then this value of a contract will be exactly equal to zero. And maybe this is a very simple contract, and maybe this is, you could say, it's actually trivial, uh, but this is very insightful as it gives us the, uh, this, this construction allows us to specify so-called forward rate. So this is what we will have here. Generally, the fair strike rate, or fair rate K, for interbank lending, with a trade date T, so this is uh, T, actually it should be, we have a T, which in this case was over T0, starting at some certain date, TK minus one, maturity date, TK, with a tenor. So this difference between two different dates, we call it a tenor, um, is defined as follows. So you see that this construction that we have just defined here, it is equivalent with the strike. So this is this called forward rate. So forward rate is something that we see at a given time. So given time t, we have a rate over investment over a certain period of time. And that's, that rate is related to this specific cash flow. So we have investment at time t, k minus 1, and then we receive it at time tk. And this is exactly what this represents. Uh, this is very fundamental. So 
it is always important to keep that uh, in mind, this formula, and where it comes from. Uh, this will be used, especially if you talk about market models, and in general, once we talk about swaps and interest rate products, this, this is the block which is used in all sorts of derivatives. So this is a fundamental instrument that we are going to operate. So the LIBOR rate, think like this. It's a, it's a rate such that if we have this uh, contract here, uh, the value of this contract is equal to zero. In interest rate world, typically we deal with rates such that the value is equal to zero. So this is the convention, we call it par rates. So this means that there is no extra payments at the inception. So this means at time t0, this contract will be equal to zero. So this is the most important takeaway. This is the building block that we are going to use today many, many times for all sorts of different uh, interest rate products. Of course, once we talk about interest rate products, we never have to deal only with one particular date. Um, we have typically, let's say, if we think of a mortgage or you have uh, interest rate swaps, typically the, the payments become uh, frequent, they are reoccurring on a certain basis. So for that reason, let us formalize what exactly is the simple component or LIBOR rate. So we deal with a trading time horizon. So this is, um, let's say, this is could be maturity of, of your contract. And we have a set of payment dates. So we have a set of dates TK from, uh, actually this should be K equal to one to uh, N. And those are the uh, strictly increasing dates. So the payments always happen one after uh, each other. Then we define the so-called tenor. So if I'm talking about the tenor, it will be always the difference between two consecutive dates. So this is the lingo that we are going to use in this course. Now the definition, the simple compound forward LIBOR rate is uh, defined. So if we have a given tenor tau k and we have a zero coupon bond, which is the risk-free bond maturing at time tk, so this is defined in this way, the LIBOR forward rate, we have those uh, LIBOR defined as LT, and then we have a two indices over which rate or over which period it corresponds to, over period tk minus one tk, then this LIBOR rate is defined as follows. This is exactly what we have seen before. Uh, in the previous slide, we have seen here one, but this is equivalent to representation. So it's one over this accruing period, then we have a difference between two zero coupon bonds divided by the later payment. As you can see, it's, uh, it's the same representation. If we look at the, the common de denominator, this will be equivalent representation is there. In this course and also in the book, you can see that for notional convenience, we use the LKT, and then this K will be always the payment date, so it will be always corresponding to K. This means that uh, the rate will be established at time TK minus one. And this was this is also uh, commonly used. So if we have a if we look at this, we put as date T to tk minus one, then we have a rate over a whole period as seen as date tk minus one. Typically this first date, it's called a reset date because this means that our rate will be fixed at that point. So if we look at this uh, picture, once we are here, we already know the payment and this rate over for which we have to pay, it will be determined. So this is a reset date. And here in this case, the, 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 the last date, took the payment date of this uh, particular contract. Of course, if we talk about this LIBOR rate, this, is, this LIBOR rate uh, defines the expectation of the rate over that period. It doesn't mean that this rate is fixed because we have this time element here. This means that this rate can also fluctuate in time as we have seen for the sh short rate models. So for example, we could have this period uh, T1, so T1, we have T2, so, but our labor rate could still fluctuate. It can be moving still a lot uh, until it hits this period T1 and that period T1 it is fixed. So then at time T1, we, there is no uncertainty anymore because this will be just determined. So until this moment TK minus one, this quantity is stochastic. Once this L T reaches this point T1, there is no stochasticity more in that point in time. Of course, from today's perspective, it's still a stochastic random variable. So from today's perspective, this is still stochastic. But if we are at time tk minus one, this is already determined. So then the rate is known. This is why it's called a reset date. In the simple compound rate, 
as we have seen, two parties exchange one euro, let's say, or a different amount of money at a given time, or actually given two times, at the reset date and also at the payment date. However, two counterparties can also agree about exchanging uh, interest rate, so about exchanging forward rate. So as we have seen in the previous slide, we, the, the interest rate, the forward rate, it's stochastic from time t0 until maturity or until the reset date, time t1, and then this rate for this period is fixed. So what two counterparties can do, they can also say at time t1, we are going to exchange the, the floating rate, so the rate that we see here, against certain strike, certain fixed rate. And that fixed rate is basically the rate that two counterparties agree to trade. So this is this leads us to the so-called forward rate agreement. So this is a, a very popular product in the interest rate uh, market, uh, where it is very common, like we just discussed, to fix an interest rate at the future date tk minus one. So this is the, the period we have uh, tk minus one, the period t k, and this is we have here time t zero. Okay, so we are fixing at this point uh, the rate. So this would be a LIBOR rate, uh, as we have seen here, tk minus one over this period tk minus one tk, and we exchange it with a fixed rate uh, k. So we see that we are paying, and actually we are paying k fixed, and we are receiving floating rates. Then if we look at this uh, uh, contract, so the forward rate agreement actually specifies as follows. So we have accruing period, and we have a difference between the, the floating rate and a fixed rate. So in this contract, actually, you would say you're a fixed payer, a payer of FRA. And then we also divide it by 1 plus tau k, uh, LIBOR, tk minus 1, tk minus 1, tk. Uh, this division here, it might look a little bit confusing where it comes from. Why, actually, if I have a contract specified at this date, why it is actually this division here? And this is actually related to the fact that this payoff here, we are looking at time tk minus 1. We are not looking at the time tk, because now at time tk, you would exchange your cash flows. And here, our perspective is time tk minus 1, at the moment of a, of a reset. So in this, actually this part here, it is related discounting from this period of the cash flow into the, to this period. So let's take a look uh, at the definition of a LIBOR rate and that reset date tk minus 1. So this is what we have. We, have a, we observe LIBOR rate at tk minus 1 over period tk minus 1 tk. So if you look at this definition of a forward LIBOR rate, we have defined before. So this is actually the relation. So um, if you look here, and this may be definition from here, if you would set here tk minus one, you would see that this quantity here will be equal to one. Then we end up with a tk minus one tk divided by tk. So that's uh, basically what why we have this expression here. So the zero coupon bond tk minus one tk, it can be expressed in terms of LIBORs. And this is to the fact that a LIBOR, a zero coupon bond, TK minus one, TK minus one is simply equal to one. Then if you look at this expression, which we have here, we actually see this actually one over this expression is a zero coupon bond. So this is this term. So we can write for our payoff at time TK minus one as simply exchanging of the rates at time TK discounted with the zero coupon bond TK minus one TK. So this is our formal definition of the payoff function at time tk minus one. So of course, now is the time to price. So we're pricing as we used to do. So we have a risk neutral uh, measure. So we have a discounting. So it's an expectation under Q measure. We divide with the money savings account from the payment date at tk minus one. We don't do money savings account on tk because this payoff from time tk it's already discounted to the time tk minus one. So we only, so the cash flow is already brought to tk minus one. We have to bring it to time t zero. So then we discount the money savings account. Of course, now we can uh, we can work it out. So some elements, if you use the definition of the LIBOR rate, will cancel out with those uh, uh, this uh, zero coupon bond. And this is what we will have here. So we have a one minus zero coupon bond tk minus one tk uh, divided by money savings account tk minus one. We have also the second part with the accruing period, 
uh, fixed rate k. And you, here we also have uh, uh, the same as here, minus same is account tk minus one tk. Uh, minus same is account, this will be tk minus one. And then here we have a zero coupon bond tk minus one to time tk. So it is exactly the same expression as here. Okay, so now, um, because we know that uh, uh, under the risk neutral measure, so under the Q measure, uh, every tradable asset here and also here, discounted with the money savings account, it's a it's martingale. This is something what we have seen already many times. So we have a, if I have a S T stock money savings account time T, at time here we will do time T zero. This under Q measure, so under risk neutral measure. This has to be equal to S T zero M T zero. And the same principle holds also for uh, zero coupon bonds. Because if you look here, this, this uh, argument here, this uh, uh, TK, it doesn't really matter. It tells you about some future date. It doesn't, it's not so much relevant. What is relevant is actually that you're observing your zero coupon bond at time TK minus one, which corresponds to the money savings account. So this is equivalent as it would be here S TK minus one divided by MTK minus one. So this is, resembles the same quantity. So this means that you can actually, from here you have, of course, this part here, it will be zero coupon bond from T0 to TK minus one. And then we have this part to be bond from T0 to TK, because this part does not really change by the, uh, by change by uh, discounting, because this, this parameter always stays fixed. So this is what we have here. So we have a PT0 TK minus one minus PTK. So let me see here. So this would be this first part. Um, this we bond T0 uh, TK minus one. So this is this point here. In the second expression, we have a this zero coupon bond. If we discount it, basically it will be P T0 TK. And this one, would become P T zero T K minus one. So this is what we have here, P T K minus P T zero T K minus one. And for the second term, we have a minus here, a P T zero T K. This is what we see here. And for the second part is the same. So it's exactly the same expression. So it would be a minus tau K times K. Uh, then we have a P T and this will be T zero. And then this argument here, TK, stays the same. So this is the expression. What you can also do, we can, at this point, because we have C, we have zero coupon bonds, we also have a relation with this TK uh, here, tau K. What we can do, we can use the definition of a liberate uh, at um, T0, TK minus one TK. So if you, this is equivalent, so we see that the value of FRA today, it is equal to tau K. And then we have this accruing period, uh, discounting from a payment date at time TK. And then we have a forward rate minus K. And this expression already we have discussed that we use this uh, relation that uh, zero coupon bond at time T0 with maturity at time TK minus one. It is an expectation of one, one over money savings account. So this is, I think I illustrated already uh, here. This is this relation that we see here. And then most commonly, exactly like we have done for the simply compounded rate, the FRAs are traded at zero value, which implies that the for fixed rate, the rate K should be equal to this amount. Uh, it is very common that if we have, a, especially let's say, if, imagine yourself, if you buy a mortgage or you buy some um, installments with a long time uh, to pay out, uh, then you're at the inception, your payment initially would be zero. Then this means that your installments would be already adjusted for this fact that today, this uh, price of entering to the contract is set to zero. However, your payments, monthly payments, will be, uh, correspondingly, they will be much higher in order to compensate for that, uh, that convenience that today you don't need to pay anything. If you would, your prepayment or payment at inception would be larger, this means that you have reduced your overall cost. This means that every month your uh, installments will be lower. And this is exactly what we also see here. We always choose a uh, fixed rate such that the, the inception contract is worth zero.
Another heavily traded interest rate product is so-called floating rate note. And it's typically if you hear FRN, that's always related to the floating rate note. Uh, similar as we have seen for FRA, it, um, it is defined in terms of LIBOR rates. Like actually most of the interest rate products we will see from now on, uh, we will be dealing with uh, market instruments present in the market. Typically those are expressed in uh, forward LIBOR rates. Um, the FRN uh, is an instrument which every coupon is defined in this way. So we have uh, coupons from taking place from point i equal 1 until m minus 1 and we have a final coupon at i equal to m. So you see that uh, at time tk, uh, this is the payment at time tk, we will receive a notional times the accruing periods. So the accruing is the distance uh, between tk minus 1 and tk. We end the, the L is the forward rate. And this forward rate, you'll see we will get a fraction of this notional. And then we do it for every, basically, at, if we look here, the graph, at every point, so it will be, let's say, 1, 2, until point m minus 1, we always receive this uh, floating rate, because it, we never know beforehand what is the value, where is this rate will be. So it's an omega zigzag, could be also higher. And then we receive, at every point, we receive, receive a notional times the occurring period times LIBOR rate. And this will be for all of them. So you see that actually it's because it's stochastic, LIBOR rate is not fixed. It's only fixed at this moment. So from today's perspective, it's still a stochastic quantity. But we look at the expectations. This is what determines the value of FRN today. And overall, the value of this contract is defined as the summation of all of those payments for the, each date. So here we have a payment determined at the previous point and so on. So each individual uh, payment is defined as follows. So we have a, a present value at time t0 of each payment tk. Uh, it is given as follows. We have expectation on the risk neutral measure. And of course, we have a, a discounting from the payment. So the payment takes place at time tk. So we discount with the money savings account. What you can also do, we can change measure to the forward measure. Because you see here, this FRN, is, uh, well, it is stochastic, right? So it is defined in some interest rate world. And we have also have money savings account. So if you like to solve it, or you like to find this expectation, you need to find the joint distribution between this MT and also LIBOR rate. So in interest rate world, it's always convenient if we have, in particular, this kind of linear uh, payoff in terms of a LIBOR rate, that what we will do, we will change the measure to the payment measure. So then we change the measure to the uh, TK forward measure. So we have a TK forward measure, and here we have a zero coupon bond, which comes outside. So now only one thing we have to find out is to what is the expectation under the TK forward measure of each FRN at time uh, K index, with K index. And then we have to substitute this part. OK, so this is what I was just trying to plot there. Here, here is much more uh, nicer illustration. So you see that every point uh, TK we will have a, a payment. So we, we basically here we are at time T1. So this is the first payment that will take place. Then we have a second payment and so on. And at the end, we have a, uh, we have one more payment. So this is the, the important uh, payment because we will still receive a fraction, a percentage of the notional, but we will also receive the notional. So this is a kind of final payment. So we have a cash flows as a fraction of the notional, but we also receive the notional. This also means that um, the value today will be also this, let's say, notion will be taken into account. So you can also think of let's say, putting money, lending some certain amount of money today, and then we receive this money back with some floating uh, payments uh, from today until the, the end date. Okay, so let's analyze now because what we decided that we are going to change the measure into to the T forward measure, uh, what impact would that have on our LIBOR uh, rate? So LIBOR rate is the TK minus 1. This is the moment we see it. And we have uh, two periods, TK minus 1 and TK. By definition, for every time T, this is the, our definition of the LIBOR. OK, so let's take an expectation under TK forward measure of this LIBOR rate. So we have a, a LIBOR which resets at time TK minus 1. And then we take a, a TK measure. This measure here, you see, it always corresponds to the payment of the LIBOR. This is very important. 
if the measure here would not correspond to the date tk, but tk minus one, for example, then we will have to deal with so-called convexity adjustment. And that will be also discussed later in this course. We actually will be discussing exactly this example uh, where we have a payment will happen at a different measure than it is. Uh, so measure is tk, for example, and a payment takes place at tk plus one, tk minus one. If you have a misalignment between measure and the payment date, then there is some uncertainty, and that will be explaining in a in few lectures from now, uh, that needs to be taken into account if you really want to value it correctly. Uh, but here, everything is nicely aligned. We have a LIBOR which pays at time TK, so this contract pays at time TK, and we have a corresponding measure, so everything is nicely aligned. And always be alerted, always look at the measure and look what is under the expectation when the, those things are aligned. So, okay, if we now use definition of the forward plate, right? So we substitute this definition here at time tk minus one, this is what we have. And of course, this is already what we have uh, seen in the previous slide that uh, actually, uh, since this measure here corresponds to this zero point bond, this means that every quantity which is discounted with respect to this zero point bond has to be martingale. It's exactly the same story as we have seen for this uh, money savings account when we have stock at capital time t we have a m t this has to be martingale sorry to feel empty here under the risk neutral measure however if we have a t forward measure then this discounting part it is not any money savings account but will be zero coupon bond corresponding to that measure so the same uh, principle holds so in this case we see nicely that if we just substitute the LIBOR dynamics, LIBOR definition, we see that the measure corresponds to the numeral. This means that all those quantities have to be martingales. And also maybe from this point, you can see that if this measure would not correspond to this numeral, so for example, here we will have a payment at TK minus one, then we have a problem because we, the measure does not correspond to numeral. And this is the reason why we have some additional adjustments, some corrections, convexity corrections, we need to take into account. But at this point, everything is nicely uh, defined. So this means that those quantities are martingales. So this means that if we have here filtration FT, those are quantities just that this FTK minus one becomes T. This TK minus one becomes also, here is actually a mistake, should be small t. And this, again, is a definition of the LIBOR rate. So we have uh, the, the conclusion is that LIBOR with a payment at time TK under TK forward measure is a martingale, so this important quantity. This also means that this could be applied now to pricing of our uh, floating rate node because we have seen here that our expression, it is under TK measure and each FRM payment, it's a LIBOR rate. So this is very nice. Of course, we have this additional notional, but this doesn't really matter because since it's constant, measure is not going to affect this uh, quantity. Okay, so let's use this fact that uh, each LIBOR, TK LIBOR is a martingale. So then we, this is the final result that if we have this uh, uh, expectation, then the solution for it is simply the today's LIBOR or LIBOR seen today over this period of time. This is the same here, and the notion is not affected. So basically, the pricing equation can be represented in this way. Uh, the most important element here, again, keep in mind that this is expectation. So this is value that we see today. It, of course, if the LIBOR moves today from tomorrow, and this value will be different, then we also affected in evaluation. So keep in mind those LIBOR rates are not fixed rates. Those are stochastic, stochastic quantities, and this is important to keep in mind. An extension of the floating rate node um, is uh, a swap contract. Swap contract is the most popular um, product in the interest rate market. So this is also very important to understand the main principles, uh, also the linguistic, what kind of language is used to describe particular configuration of this contract. So um, in a swap, essentially a swap is associated with exchange. So one party received, received some payment, uh, and other party has to pay something. Uh, and this is why it is called swap. Uh, 
In a swap, we have a, a payer and receiver. So the, the, the notion of a payer and receiver is always related to the fixed rate. So if you pay fixed rate, you are called swap payer. If you receive swap rate, you're a swap receiver. So this could be, you see, it's a LIBOR minus K, but it could also be K minus LIBOR rate. Uh, so this is uh, a time T0, actually, so this is the payoff at time TM. So I've, those are the cash flows we will receive if we buy or sell uh, a swap. So here we have a tau K times the notional times the LIBOR uh, rate minus K. So you see the swap contract is defined as the sequence of payments over period of time. So this is just a natural extension of a, a floating rate node where we had uh, uh, where we uh, just had a contract which completely relied only on uh, uh, on the LIBOR rate. Now we have an exchange of uh, cash flows. Uh, this contract in particular, it's, uh, it's quite important because, for example, if you have a mortgage, you're always a payer of the fixed rate. So if you have a fixed rate mortgage, you always pay uh, a fixed amount on, the mail, on a monthly basis. However, bank that issues that mortgage, in order to hedge that risks, has to uh, go into the market and hedge it with a swap. So this is why swap, uh, as you can imagine, the mortgage market is a huge all, all around the world. And this is why also swap market is so popular because those are the instruments that are used to hedge those kind of risks. Also, if somebody takes a loan, a fixed rate loan or a floating rate loan, then you have a may, you may have a different configurations where it's a payer or receiver of a swap. Uh, but most important is to keep in mind that you have uh, two uh, options. You can be a swap payer if you pay fixed rate, roll, uh, rate and you receive a float. And you can also be a swap uh, receiver, which is here. This means that you will receive fixed rate and you'll be paying a float rate. And those, of course, those are the rates. They always have to be multiplied with notion and then accruing period needs to be taken into account. I put here n into square because it's also kind of uh, uh, in a box because it's also important. Um, later in this course, we will discuss particular choices of n and also extensions. So here we have a, a case where we have n, which is only deterministic. It's just a number, let's say a million, million or so, uh, but could be also stochastic quantity. And that will significantly complicate the pricing equations. But for now, we start with n to be uh, deterministic to be constant. We can also have configurations when a notional is decaying in time. So for example, if you have a mortgage and you are paying your uh, installment, monthly installments, uh, your notional can also uh, be uh, reducing in time until the uh, mortgage ends. So this notional can be also, let's say, indexed by K. So this is uh, typical in the mortgages. And, and also, like I mentioned, it can be stochastic and that's Stochasticity makes this uh, uh, pricing problem uh, much more difficult. However, in this course, we'll also discuss uh, that particular aspect. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the graph, how this uh, uh, swap payment look like. So we have uh, uh, here, it's a swap. It's also maybe something to mention. Here, we specified a swap with a frequency of payments of the same frequency. This means that we have a, a tenor structure for float and a, and a strike here. The, the fixed rate is the same. This means that, for example, payments happening on monthly basis, yearly basis, and at the same moment. So this means we have a monthly, on a yearly basis, we pay float or we receive float. We pay on a yearly basis fixed. However, those frequencies also can be different. This means that, for example, you may receive uh, a fixed rate or you pay a fixed rate on a yearly basis. However, your floating payments will be on a quarterly basis. So those combinations are also just the natural uh, settings in a, in a swap contract. In here, for the simplicity, we have just decided that it will be just a, let's make the frequency the same. But keep in mind that kind of flexibility is also uh, possible. So here we have, uh, you see that different levels. So this means that because LIBOR rates can be also stochastic. So though we, we don't, they are not predetermined today. They will be determined at reset dates. Uh, today, we only look at the expectations of the future payments. Uh, so we see, for example, here we pay, uh, um, um, we receive this amount, uh, we pay this amount. This is the payment, this is a receive, and so on. So we have, uh, over time, we have uh, 
fixed part is always the same. So we have this fixed notional that strikes will always, um, this rate will be multiplied by this notional. And if we have a frequency the same, then those payments are always uh, fixed. And for floating part, of course, there is some uncertainty related to the LIBOR dynamics. So we are not sure or we, it's, there is some stochasticity involved. So this is why we have uh, uh, randomness in those payments. Okay, if we look at the payments, so if we look at the current value, because those are the, let's say, future payments, we have uncertainty there. However, today, we would like to establish what is the today's value of a contract. And if you think about it, we are determining the value of a contract, what is seen today. However, we also know that this contract, tomorrow, the value can change because the underlying assets are stochastic. So if we issue a mortgage today, for example, and tomorrow rates will change, of course, this means that we will be uh, on the losing side. This is why so much important is to have a, a hedge. This means that the bank or any financial institution, if they have this kind of obligation where they receive, pay fixed or float rates, it's very important that they will at the same moment hedge their other side, let's say if it's a fixed or against float, in the market. So the other side of the payments will be hedged in the market so that if the market will uh, change uh, will change in time, then the differences from or profits or loss losses from one side will be compensated from another transaction. At this point, you can ask, okay, so if you have uh, cash flows and you will lose, hedging is always nice because then the loss, loss will be uh, compensated. But if the, uh, you have gained, and your hedging will also consume your gains. So the question will be, so where is the profit? How actually bank can make money? And the, the trick lies in uh, additional charge. So if you pay your mortgage, uh, so for example, if you have this kind of transactions, you pay your mortgage, and this is a fair value of a swap. So this is the value that we will see in the market. So the, the, the bank that you owe, the institution that could charge you the payment, the fixed rate payments, on a monthly basis for your mortgage could be, for example, K plus some epsilon. And this epsilon uh, essentially compensates or it's a profit for the bank. And this compensates also for the, all the costs associated with a handling of your mortgage and also of the hedging of the risks. Because if you have a mortgage, you can also prepay some uh, uh, costs. This means that although you have a fixed uh, plan, your payment plan for your mortgage, you may also additionally pay something back extra. That also will need to be included in this, let's say, additional charge that you will be charged at the inception of the contract. But for this, this topic will be discussed uh, later in this course when we focus on mortgages and prepayments and pricing of mortgages. Let's go back to the pricing of a swap. So uh, we see that swap is a nice contract because we have uh, sums of payments. So this is this very similar what we have seen already for the floating rate note. We have a, a LIBOR rates minus some strike. We have a linear relation, so this is nice too. And we discount every payment with the money savings account. So of course, because of the linearity of the expectation, we can change some of the expectation and then we change the measure too. So we have a first summation, we have those expectations. And for each LIBOR, we change measure from the risk neutral measure to the forward measure. You see it's nicely, instead of having this uh, money savings account, we have a bond, zero coupon bond that we can see in the market because it's T0, so we see in the market. If you look at the M, uh, TK, this is not seen in the market, we need to be simulated. And of course, because our LIBOR rate is a martingale, we can simply substitute, we can use this property, so the swap will be determined as the summation of accruing periods uh, over uh, zero coupon bond time the difference times the difference of a LIBOR rate minus strike. And that will basically, you see, uh, we can just calculate the value of a swap without actually using any model. Because if we have a yield curve, from the yield curve, we can calculate zero coupon bonds. We can also calculate this uh, LIBOR rate, which is also given in terms of zero coupon bonds. So this means that swap value, we can price it without any model assumptions regarding the dynamics. If you have any dynamics for the bonds, for example, for um, zero coupon, you have used whole white model for simulating short rates. We know because whole white model is a term structure model, then yield will be also natural 
input for the model. So yield curve will be always perfectly calibrated in the full white setting. This means that even if you would simulate those zero coupon bonds using full white model, then the swap value will be exactly the same as the one directly calculated from the yield curve. Today in the slides, also we will look at the experiment where we'll be pricing some, some swaps too, so that maybe will be uh, a bit clearer. Okay, um, now what we can do, because we already know the value of a swap, so of course we can also, uh, you can see here, we have summation of a difference, we can decompose this into a, a, a difference of summations, of sums. So then we have a part for the floating part, we have a part for the uh, fixed part, and what we can also do, so if we take this first equation, or first term, we can write down and use the definition of a LIBOR rate. So if we substitute, we will see that something nicely cancels out because this zero coupon bond will cancel with this bond. Accruing this tenor will be also out. So we end up with a difference of a consecutive zero coupon bonds. Of course, you can easily recognize that this is a telescopic summation. This means that your value of a swap will only depend on the first payment, essentially, on the bond for the first date and the bond at the, the last payment. So actually in this setting, you see that uh, in this swap, we define that we have some future dates. So this first payment doesn't happen today or in the next month, but this is some M could be in the future. So we have uh, here, you can see that this T1 is not next month, but could be, let's say, a year from now, and the swap lasts for 30 years. So, okay, so uh, this means also uh, that we have only those two payments. So if we have, if we actually put this expression together, so this is the value of a swap. And interestingly, if you would choose your stride equal to zero, and you like to hedge your swap that you have just bought or sold, you see that the hedging would only uh, be influenced by the first and the last zero coupon bond of the whole swap. So if your K would be zero, then this part would be gone then the value will be determined only by the first and the last zero coupon bond, which is kind of surprising because you have a payments over whole, uh, let's say, agenda, whole, uh, you have whole plan of payments over, let's say, next 30 years. However, if you would like to uh, hedge it initially, you only need to handle the first and the last zero coupon bond. And of course, this is the case where you have strikes equal to zero. So this is kind of nice, surprising result. Um, what we also have, so it's uh, because swaps are kind of matured contracts, so many things are already called uh, and they have a naming. And uh, the, one of the interesting names to always the, the worth to remember is the annuity factor. Annuity factor is this factor here in front of our strike. So if we take uh, this whole this summation, that's called annuity. Annuity is associated with uh, um, the basis, the value of a basis point. So if you have a percent, that's uh, let's say a hundred of a uh, of a unit, then basis point is a hundred of a percent. So because in interest rate world we deal with notionals which are huge, so notional of a medium is considered to be small. Um, typically, swaps could be on uh, tens or hundreds of millions. Then percentage of those amounts are typically also very big. So in order to actually uh, put this more important, that if you deal with those large numbers, actually basis points is the uh, the, the price often that you see. So the basis points is very important unit, especially if you have uh, very big notionals. Uh, what we can also see is that uh, before we have seen the measure changes, related to the zero coupon bond on particular uh, time TK, right? Uh, however, now we deal with a summation of, uh, of those zero coupon bonds. And what is interesting fact is that if you have a, a, a number here, which is a tradable asset, then also linear combination of, of those tradable assets is also tradable. So this is important. So this means that if this is tradable, summation of all those tradable assets is also tradable. So this means that annuity AML is also numerier, good numerier that we can use in the evaluation. So this is also something important that we'll be using later in this uh, in this course. Um, so here, this is the uh, this line where annuity can be used as a numerier. Um, Interest rate, uh, interest rate swaps are considered perfect interest rate instruments where two parties can hedge their particular exposure. So like I mentioned, examples of uh, pricing of mortgages or loans 
where you have a fixed or float uh, payments. Of course, if you buy a mortgage, for example, you have a loan for say 20,000 euros or dollar, dollars, this doesn't mean that the bank would immediately hedge this amount. Uh, because that's uh, also uh, those notionals in the market for swaps are huge, are considerably larger. This means that if a bank would like to hedge it, then those loans from individuals will be compressed together, they'll be collected, and then the hedging will take place at a much larger scale. At the portfolio level, you can see, uh, consider of a small loans. This is why if we look at the um, mortgage portfolios, then we always look from the perspective of uh, tens or hundreds of uh, thousands, thousands of uh, uh, different mortgages. Um, yes, and maybe one more thing that if you uh, have a swap, it's a standard practice that you choose your strike such that the value of a swap at the inception will be equal to zero. This is something we already have seen before when we talk about uh, the float rate nodes or even in the simply compounded rate, we choose strike such that the value of the contract will be zero. So if you buy a mortgage also, this means that your inception, we choose the rate such that you have no immediate repayments. Payments will start according to some uh, uh, schedule, which will happen in the future. So this is the same holds for, uh, uh, for swaps. On the other hand, if we set the value of a strike or the fixed rate such that the value of a swap is equal to zero, this means we can enter such a deal for free. Because this means, means that in order to start the swap to be one side of the swap, then there is no cost that we have to pay initially, only we have to follow the, the payment schedule. Uh, on the other hand, there is also market convention. Another one is that if we uh, find this fixed rate such that the value of a swap is equal to zero, that's typically indicated by SMN, and that's called a swap rate. So if somebody refers to a swap rate, and give you a specification for MNN, you know that the swap uh, that is corresponding to this rate is such that if you evaluate uh, this swap with the K equal to this uh, rate, the value of such a swap will be equal to zero. The swap rate, is equal, swap rate corresponds to this particular strike, which makes the uh, value at the inception equal to zero. And of course, if it's equal to zero, this is how we can also uh, define it. Then this means that uh, K is equal to, uh, or our swap rate is equal to a difference of the first z payment date, zero coupon bond for first payment date, minus the last one divided by the annuity. Uh, what we can also do, we can uh, reformulate it slightly and express our uh, swap rate as the weighted sum of uh, LIBOR rates. So this is also a possible uh, convention. Um, and finally, uh, a swap rate, this is also a really nice, tight uh, uh, equation um, can be expressed as the, the value of a swap can be expressed the annuity at time t0 minus the swap minus fixed rate. So every swap you can represent also in that nice way. So the, 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 the part we hear is the swap rate at which swap <laughs> would be equal to zero. And this is just a redefinition. Using that definition of a swap rate, we can also redefine our swap in terms of uh, swap rate. So this is uh, maybe a little bit too confusing, but this is an elegant way, actually comes from the uh, simple algebra, uh, this relation. Um, what are the assumptions that we need to know uh, if we talk about swap? So if we talk about options, etc., we always think of a stochastic model we need to have to evaluate such option. In terms of swaps, you see that everything is expre expressed in terms of a yield curve of zero coupon bonds. Of course, Yield curve is always interpolation between uh, different spine points. Those are implied by different zero coupon bonds. So this is maybe, a, you can say, it's still there is some kind of effect of the interpolation, especially if the payments will not happen exactly at the spine points. But uh, commonly, swap is considered to be a market instrument that you can directly read it from the market. And if you don't know, uh, if you have only yield curve, you can calculate the swap rate using the yield curve. In the following uh, numerical experiment, we will also do that. We will evaluate swaps using uh, yield curve, and we compare that evaluation to a swap using full white model. Uh, that will be a, a nice comparison. Um, so another remark, in order to price a basic interest rate swap, the pricing can be done without any assumptions of the underlying model. So here we didn't make any specification whether a swap has to be normal, log normal, what kind of dynamics. 
uh, the pricing can be simply done by using interest rate instruments available in the market. So here, I mean, we have interest, interest rate instruments in the market. We will map those instruments to a yield curve. From this yield curve, we will calculate zero coupon bonds that are going to be used in the valuation of a swap. Exactly the procedure of mapping of a different market instruments to a yield curve. This will be discussed in a follow-up uh, lecture where we only focus, where we will focus on a construction of a yield curve given market instruments. So then you will have a complete picture how this can be performed. And maybe one more uh, remark regarding the notional. So in the, in the first, one of the first slides, we had this uh, notional for a swap with uh, uh, in a box. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, you can also, um, this notional can be also uh, time dependent. So it can be indexed by K. Um, if it's time dependent, basically it doesn't change the methodology that we have just described for swap pricing, because if this quantity is uh, deterministic, we can always take it outside of the expectation. So this means that the properties in the uh, and here in the bracket, so this this uh, uh, martingality is not disturbed. So this still it is expressed in market in terms of market instruments. However, notional can be uh, uh, can be random. You can basically say, okay, I have a particular schedule for notional, and we have also uh, two different, three different types of notional. So if the notional is decreasing in time, then we talk about amortizing notional. So it's amortizing in time if it's always decreasing in k. We can also have a accreting uh, uh, notional. So this is the case when notionals are increasing in time. We can also have a roller coaster. So you have uh, notionals increasing and then they are dec decreasing in time. And then uh, also important one, we can have a notional which is defined in terms of uh, some market instruments. Uh, or you see here, notional is a function of some LIBOR rates. And this is also possible one of the possibilities. Um, later in this course, we will discuss actually this will be kind of important case and also the amortizing case. Amortizing case is the situation where you have a mortgage and stochastic notional is that if your prepayment of your mortgage will depend also on the market uh, situation. So if the rates went direct very much down, then you, are more, you have more incentive to prepay your mortgage. And that will be case of the stochastic notional. This will be discussed in the follow-up lecture too. Uh, something important. So we have seen that if we have a LIBOR rate, so we have here LIBOR TK, uh, and we have a corresponding measure here. So these two things match. We know that the LIBOR is a martingale. So we have this uh, relation that it's actually just a LIBOR at time t0. However, if you have a scenario where, for example, LIBOR squared, we have LIBOR, so this is this LIBOR, this is LIBOR squared, and we have exactly the same scenario. We have TK here, and we have a TK here as the measure. This is not the case. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind. Uh, this is expression we have seen, it's a martingale because it's uh, expressed in terms of uh, tradable assets, so number here is a money, so, uh, zero coupon bond with particular TK uh, maturity. However, if you have squared, zero coupon bond squared is not tradable assets. So tradable assets, if you have some tradable assets like bonds, stocks, etc., if you have a linear combination of them, then those are still tradable assets. However, if you start making squares or whatever other function you would choose, which is not linear, then this relation does not hold. To give you an example, uh, if we, we know that here under TK forward measure, LIBOR is a martingale. This means that we can uh, essentially uh, impose the dynamics for that LIBOR rate. So we can say, okay, we have just a kind of a, a geometric brown motion. I mean, it's not exactly like Black-Scholes model, but it's a geometric brown motion without drift. So it's because we know that the, this LIBOR is a martingale, so we have a only volatility part. And we assume also the LIBOR, it is a exponential form with some constant sigma. Okay, so now if we take a, a, another function, so we have a function f from t, which will be defined as L squared of t, and we apply ethos lemma to this function, this is what happens. We see that this L squared, so dL squared, has, after application of ethos lemma, this is uh, not a martingale. Actually, this is not good correction. This is not good expression here. So this, this should be gone. 
Yes. So then you see that this dynamics of a LIBOR has two elements, has a drift and has a, also the volatility part. And what is important is to see that actually, okay, this part is good because this is just, a, a, that, that actually supports the claim that this is a martingale. However, because we have this drift effect, this means that L squared is not a martingale under the T forward measure. So this is actually a formal proof to show this doesn't hold. And this is something to be, keep in mind. And if you see somewhere a square, square root, or whatever uh, other function you can choose, which is not linear, then uh, always be alerted with the measures and martingalities. This is very, very important. And now it's a time for an experiment. So now what we'll do, we will um, first evaluate swap using a yield curve. We will also evaluate swap using Hulumet model. And we will also perform some kind of par finding a swap uh, with a par swap. So this means that the swap rate at which the value of a swap is equal to zero. Okay, so here's the code. I prepared the, um, a few lines of code. Um, so here with a, um, a function. So here with the most important part, we have a specification of a yield curve. So this is a yield curve we already have seen before. Uh, so it is a function of zero coupon bonds, bonds with a B-spline interpolation. Uh, then we have, uh, uh, as I always do already, we have seen in the previous experiments, uh, first point, I always compare market zero coupon bonds versus uh, full white zero coupon bonds. If I deal with full, full white model, this ensures there is no bugs that were introduced uh, on the way. So this will be represented in figure number one. And in here, what we do next, we generate paths, but actually those paths are actually not even needed here because if we look at the, the swap evaluation, so this is, takes place here, uh, we have a full white swap, but full white swap at time t0 only depends on uh, initial uh, interest rate. So this is only R0. So the simulation of a path is not important. Uh, full white swaps will be given explicitly in form of the exponential form of zero coupon bonds. And then we have a swap which is generated from the yield curve. So you see that input here is a zero coupon bond curve, and then we store those uh, um, those results. So this will be the first in the figure number two. We will be plotting uh, swaps for different strikes. So we will see uh, how this uh, uh, swap value changes in strike. We already have seen that's kind of a it's a linear function of strike. So swap value is a linear function of strike. And then what we will do next, uh, we will choose strike equal to zero. We will check the price of this uh, swap. And later, what I'm going to do, I'm going to check what is the swap rate. So this means I'm going to define a swap as a function of strikes. And then I'm going to apply newton Raphson to find out what is the value, what strike, for which strike is the value of this swap equal to zero. And that will be our power, uh, uh, power swap. So let me run it. OK, so. Uh, maybe this is the, the final results, but let's take a look here. So we have a zero coupon bond. We have a value of a swap as a function of a strike. Now let's take a, let's take a look at the zero uh, strike value. You see it's not zero. So if I choose strike equal to zero, we have a value above. I think this is more than 2,000. So indeed, I just see that we have a, a small typo here because this ki here, it should not be ki because we are looking for a uh, strike equal to zero. So what we should do here, we should do k equal to 0, 0.0. And then instead of ki, we just do k, run it again. And indeed, so we see that the swap value is 2.8 thousand, so 2,800, which is actually the number which corresponds here. So for strike equal to zero, this is amount. We also see that the value of a swap changes linearly in strike. It's also important to see. And then here we have this result, which states that if we have k par equal to 0 0.03808 uh, and so on, then the value of a swap is close to zero. And this is actually solved here. So what we did here, we applied newton raphson algorithm. So this is something we already discussed in detail in a, a course of computational finance. We were looking for a strike for which a swap value was equal to zero. So it's a par value of a swap, par swap. And then we have then 
10 to minus 13. Of course, you can go even lower here. Uh, of course, it's a matter of configuration of this uh, uh, Newton swap, a uh, Newton uh, algorithm. 